Buddha teaches us that we don't really know what's what, but we do have an innate capacity to know what's what. And the, the faith and the confidence that we have in the Buddha, and the Buddha's enlightenment, is one and the same thing as our faith and confidence in our capacity to know what's what. This is because the Buddha was enlightened as a human being and through his enlightenment demonstrated, proved the capacity of human beings for enlightenment. Uh, we can say he became enlightened as a representative of the human race, as it were. And if we have faith in the Buddha's enlightenment, then we also, the implication, have faith <coughs> in the human capacity for enlightenment and therefore the next logical step and that is that we have faith in our own capacity for enlightenment. So faith in the Buddha means faith in ourselves, faith in our own capacity uh, to realize the truth of things and that not only can we realize the truth of things, uh, but we should. So faith in, <coughs> in Buddhism is something that leads onwards. It's not merely the acceptance of a system of beliefs, but the fundamental faith or confidence is in our ability to abandon the unwholesome, to develop the wholesome, to purify our minds. So we, if we have any, any real, um, <coughs> let us say, sincerity in that belief, then we have to put it to the test. We believe that we can abandon the unwholesome, so we try to abandon the wholesome, unwholesome to see whether that belief is, is tenable, whether it's an accurate, true, um, belief, one based on the way things are or not. Similarly, um, our belief in our ability to, um, uh, to develop the wholesome and to purify our minds. Now, the our normal or our um, conditioned way of understanding ourselves and the way things are is, the Buddha says, um, inaccurate and false. And wherever and in whatever circumstance we have a false unfounded understanding, belief, view of the way things are, then craving arises. So craving is that kind of <coughs> desire which arises from ignorance, uh, lack of 
true vision and understanding um, and wrong vision and understanding. So ignorance and craving um, always um, arise together. And so in our efforts to abandon the unwholesome, develop the wholesome, purify the mind, we have to deal with both the ignorance and the craving which sustain the whole structure of um, dukkha, suffering. Now the in our, our practice uh, we therefore need um, to develop to to aspects, to, to wings of uh, practice. One is the wisdom faculty which uh, directly counteracts and undermines ignorance. And the other is peace and clarity which undermines craving. So the wisdom faculty, the understanding, right view, um, investigation of the nature of our bodies and minds, the world in which we live, will only really um, be successful and penetrate deeply when the mind has been stabilized, clarified. It is very common in meditation practice to reach a certain stage in which um, it's almost as if one peeks over the edge of the cliff or the abyss um, and almost automatically withdraws um, and fear envelops the mind. So merely um, an acceptance of Buddhist teachings, interest in um, investigation of impermanence, of suffering, of not self, is inadequate for the job because we need to have the emotional resilience and stability of mind to be able to face up to um, the implications and the uh, results of, of that kind of investigation. And one of the central paradoxes of, of practice is that only the happy mind can really understand suffering. If the mind is suffering, it appropriates suffering as um, belonging to self. And so, to put it simply, if the mind lacks the ability um, to, to uh, maintain itself in a stable and clear state, um, we experience my suffering. And knowing that I am suffering is not an understanding of the first noble truth. The understanding of the first noble truth is suffering arises um, due to um, the second noble suffering, craving. So comprehension of, of suffering um, entails an absence of the sense of self. And the stable mind produced by the ability to sustain, maintain uh, mindfulness for a period of time is absolutely 
essential. So these two, these two aspects of practice um, have to dovetail and work together. The, um, the wisdom faculty, the interest in looking at experience and the investigation of the three characteristics, also the interest in maintaining clarity, stability um, of mind um, through long periods of time. So investigation of, of Dhamma really um, only begins when the mind is able to free itself from the clutches of the five hindrances. The five hindrances being uh, sensual desire, aversion, sloth, torpor, um, <coughs> mental agitation, guilt, <coughs> doubt, skeptical doubt. So we don't have to talk about um, levels of, of jhana and uh, jhanas and yanas and all the technical terms, um, but the, these five hindrances uh, are very important to, to recognize and, and also to um, accept, acknowledge that only the mind which is free of those hindrances has the, um, the power, the integrity um, to understand the way things are. So we're seeking to um, maintain our minds um, in a state free of the hindrances. And that's that, that mind is one which experiences a very deep sense of well-being. And it is a brave and courageous and fearless mind. So uh, the, the calming and stabilizing aspect of meditation um, produces fearlessness and equanimity purifies mindfulness. So ability to maintain the kind of evenness of mind, ability to look, and not to be um, overwhelmed by the a sense of attraction or repulsion to phenomena that we experience is a prerequisite for um, progress in Dhamma. So the, the teachings um, of the Buddha um, some of them, or some of the teachings um, seem very simple, um, but are in fact very profound. Some seem very difficult to understand, but as we practice in, in our experience, they seem quite, quite simple. The, the teaching of, of selflessness, of anatta, is one that can be somewhat intimidating or difficult to grasp. And I think that it's, it's important to, to recognize that um, anatta um, is, is not a thing, it's not an experience, it's merely um, a rejection or a refutation of a wrong view a wrong understanding. Um, <coughs> an example, let's say um, someone phoned up the monastery and said that there was radioact radioactive material in this monastery. So we, man we managed to get hold of a Geiger counter and um, swept the Dhamma Hall and the cloister 
and all the buildings in the monastery and then we could finally conclude that there is in fact no radioactivity in the monastery. Now in Pali, the word no, the prefix um, <coughs> is, is provided by the prefix a or a. So you could say there's no radioactivity in this monastery or is an um, a Pali English hybrid here, an a radioactive monastery. But there is no a radioactivity, you know, as, a, as an essence or something that you can realize or penetrate. It's just um, a refutation of a false belief or false understanding. Um, so we use um, the mind which has been made happy, fearless, courageous, stable, um, bright and clear um, to look clearly until we see that what we thought was there is not actually there at all. But it's not that um, we gain um, some uh, experience of a thing. Um, it's not a state uh, called anatta. It's merely um, a recognition that something that we have been creating or uh, perceived um, to be present is in fact um, not, not founded on the way things are. The <coughs> um, one way of looking at our life as human beings um, is to um, compare it to a river say um, the River Thames. Now we, um, for purposes of communication, we have to agree on fixed names for things. We, couldn't, we can't change the names of physical phenomena according to their, to their changes that uh, occur within them or to them. So, the, uh, so we have something called the River Thames and we can all agree that there is such a thing as the River Thames. But the difficulty, of course, arises when we say, well, what is the River Thames? And we say, well, it's, it's the water in the River Thames. Well, if it was the water, then um, isn't it the case that all the water is running into the sea and that the, any t if you go and um, look at the River Thames today and in 10 minutes time or tomorrow or next month then the water you see is not the same water. And every single aspect, constituent of the River Thames um, is constantly changing. So <coughs> We can say there definitely is a River Thames. We're not saying that, that there isn't a River Thames. Um, but we're saying that uh, that which we refer to as the River Thames is, in fact, a constant flow, flux um, of conditions. And um, similarly with our lives, we say that there's not, it's not that there's nothing. We're not refuting our existence. We're not saying that there's no nobody here in that way, but we're saying it, what is here um, doesn't exist in the way that we usually think it does. And so we, we're looking very closely at um, ourselves and our experience of ourselves in the world. And we begin to notice that just as we have this one word, River Thames, to refer to a complex um, uh, phenomena in one part of a larger ecosystem, then we refer to ourselves as I. But what we refer to as I um, is uh, changeable. Sometimes we, we can say, uh, for instance, um, I feel tired, um, I'm happy, 
I remember, I think, I see, I hear, and we have this single word, I, but in, in the first case we're referring to the physical body, in the second case to feelings, in the third to perception, memory, fourth to thought, and fifth to consciousness. So we, uh, we can see that um, the word I doesn't change, but what we're referring to actually um, is not a stable, independent essence. And it's this sense of some stable, independent owner of experience, um, unchanging center of, of experience, which the Buddha challenges us to find. So the teaching of the four elements and the five khandhas and all these um, categories the Buddha gave us are skillful means um, to look at what's going on, at what's what. And um, the, this practice is one that we can carry on in um, every place that we happen to be and in whatever we're doing. We're, we're seeing the way that um, the body and the mind manifest. And we're, sort of, we're seeking skillful means to look more closely, more directly. We're studying, we're observing those ways of thinking, those ways of um, <coughs> acting, which um, enable us to stay more um, closely with the way things are and those things which obscure the way things are. For instance, we, we notice that if we uh, do not, um, we are not very careful and scrupulous in the way that we behave to our family members, to uh, our friends and colleagues, workmates, then we tend to feel um, a lot of remorse and lack of self-respect, self-esteem. We don't really feel friends with ourselves. And when we lack that sense of self-respect, self-esteem, which comes through the ability to refrain from actions and speech that hurts others, then um, the, the sense of self is strengthened and becomes very hard and rigid, difficult to see through. So goodness is, in one sense, that which weakens the, the sense of self. And if we want to use the word uh, evil or, or badness, uh, wickedness, it's that which strengthens and, and makes real the sense of self. So this is where we, we ground these kinds of concepts of the wholesome and the unwholesome and the good and the bad, not in some exterior deity, but in the effects um, of um, actions, speech, thoughts, um, as uh, measured by the, um, the strength, the, the thickness of the, this, this sense of, of self. So this is um, something that we're constantly looking at and interested in. So we, we seek to um, develop meditation techniques. And again, um, not to gain um, 
any particular experience as um, a adjunct or, a, or a, um, a possession of self, but in order to expose and to penetrate the nature of self, uh, the self view and the, the perception of self. For instance, taking um, bodily body meditations, looking at the nature of the physical body very, very clearly in a very uh, unsentimental, unwavering way, and just looking at um, the hair of the head, and the hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. When we look at them very clearly at, 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 at hair, um, the more clearly that we look, um, the more that we that we look with the mind which is free of like and dislike and attraction and aversion, the more we are struck by, um, the more we are, we are affected by the sense of lack of ownership. It's, it's not that sense of this is me, my hair, my beautiful hair, my, my unattractive hair. Those thoughts don't arise. And it's just hair. No, hair is just like this. It's just sprouting out of my head just like this. Um, and see bodily hair. And see nails. You know, just this kind of weird, hard stuff that grows out of our, our fingers and our toes. Um, and we see um, teeth. You see how, um, how much our sense of who we are and our identity is bound up with our face and our teeth. You know, have you noticed how um, uh, the incredible transformation that takes place when somebody takes their teeth out? If, you know, and suddenly their, their, their face kind of just collapses and uh, it's just that the person disappears together with their teeth. They become somebody else somehow. And um, the... Um, and in, uh, also notice how intimately related are emotions um, and particular physical um, changes or physical manifestations. You can particularly notice that um, there are certain configurations of the muscles in your face um, which, which um, arise with particular feelings. And then you realize that it's impossible, it's very difficult to um, imagine having that feeling without that particular um, configuration. So that, that the, the sense of an emotion is something you know, inside ourselves is, is um, undermined. And it's interesting that you can that you can create feelings and emotions um, through adopting consciously adopting particular facial expressions which correspond to those emotions. So it's not just that the facial expression is a result of the emotion, but you can produce emotion by the um, conscious adoption of the facial expression. So this is, these are kind of interesting ways of, of, of looking at this sense of self. You know, if you can, you can make yourself feel um, really miserable by deliberately adopting uh, a sad facial expression. You just sort of bring the sides of the mouth down, sort of like that. If you do that long enough, you feel miserable. Uh, even if you've got nothing to be miserable about. Uh, and so it's not just sort of um, uh, sort of sentimental kind of, you know, smile and, and, you know, the world will smile with you. If you smile, you, you can find it, you just feel better. And, and this is anatta, this is selflessness. One of the great uh, forest teachers, Lumpu Te, says anatta doesn't mean that there's no self. He says there is a self, but it's not permanent. Um, 
So there, there, are, there is this constant flow um, of, uh, of phenomena. Looking at the body, looking at feelings, looking at perceptions, um, looking at thoughts, and these three characteristics of impermanence and dukkha and anatta are really three different aspects of the same thing. So the more you penetrate impermanence and the more you'll understand anatta, the more you look at anatta, the more you understand uh, dukkha. They're, they're all, you know, one leads to the other two. And um, when you realize um, how deeply and profoundly that we, um, we seek and we uh, feel the need for um, a lasting, permanent happiness, um, we realize that the sensual world and the conditioned world must inevitably always be experienced as fundamentally flawed because nothing which is impermanent can provide permanent happiness. This is when the sense of moving away and, and looking beyond the sensual world <coughs> starts to um, become a, a stronger and stronger intention in our lives. So we, um, on the level of, of sila, uh, we can, we're using our capacity to uh, refrain from certain actions and speech to illuminate intention, to drive a wedge between intention and expression and create a space in which we can um, choose whether to act or not to act and where um, questions of right and wrong, wholesome and unwholesome become practical for us. So usually uh, volition and expression um, <coughs> are one and the same thing. We, we act in many ways um, on a kind of autopilot and a way that we can create um, an initial experience of freedom and liberation in our mind is through recollection of precepts, is the mindfulness of precepts um, enables us to, um, to stop and to see so, so here we, we can talk about this, again, uh, we, technical language, samatha and vipassana, or a very simple language, stopping and looking. Um, and recollection of precepts allows us to stop and to look at what we're doing and what we're saying. Um, and noticing the, the arising and passing away of this, this sense of self. And in the... Buddhist tradition, uh, we consider that the, um, the, the birth, the, the arising of the world as simultaneous to or as a synonym for the arising of the sense of self. So um, fundamentalist Christians uh, believe that the world was created uh, 7,000 years ago. Scientists believe it was billions of years ago. Um, but the Buddhist position is that the world arises every every moment. That um, the uh, avicca, the the ignorance and craving which constitute this sense of self, arise in the mind. And so we're looking right right at that point to see um, how much um, of what we do and what we say is this rather pointless striving to promote, to um, protect, to enhance um, the sense of self. And there's this um, idea that somehow by um, gathering and um, amassing pleasant experiences that somehow um, who we are becomes richer, um, becomes more fulfilled but it's all based on a, an idea of a, an owner of experience which can be enriched 
by experience, pleasant experience, and diminished by unpleasant experience. And the Buddha says, you know, can you find that owner? Where is it? Look closely. Um, so we begin begin to notice and the and this is where the worldly dhammas um, rise. So they're living in the world, living as a sentient being in the world. We inevitably experience um, gain and loss. Prestige, rank, loss of prestige, rank, pleasure, pleasure and blame. Uh, excuse me, praise and blame, pleasure and pain. And even the the Buddha himself and the great disciples um, were never free um, of those worldly dhammas. Now sometimes we have this idea if we just do everything right, if we can just work out um, the correct way, then everyone will love us or everyone will like us or, or somehow the, um, through, through being good and pure that we will not have to deal with loss and um, decline and blame, criticism, slander, um, physical, mental pain. But um, it's not really the case. We see great disciples of the Buddha um, slandered and misrepresented on a number of occasions. Occasion when um, Venerable Mahakasapa had a number of enemies in the monastery. They were a Sangha with the Buddha at its head, staying in a monastery close to Venerable Mahakasapa's hometown and many of his relations would come to offer dana. And these monks um, considered that Ajahn, uh, excuse me, that Venerable Mahakasapa, uh, well he wasn't Ajahn, Mahakasapa, was uh, attached to the offerings and they they sat around with him and they were saying you know we're all going on Tudong at the end of the rains retreat but I bet that as it, uh, that Mahakasapa won't go he won't want to leave here he's too comfortable he's enjoying it too much and and then towards the end of the rains retreat the Buddha said to Vera Mahakasapa, um, I'm taking the monks off on Tudong, um, but I think I'm going to leave you here um, because you know all the lay people and um, so you can, you're capable of running the monastery. So the, after the rains retreat had ended, the Buddha took all the monks off and Vera Mahakasapa stayed behind and those two monks were saying, see, told you so, you know. And um, yeah, this is um, sort of normal kind of thing. So even greatest arahants can be accused of kind of pettiness and um, and defilement. It's not that you find um, some place where you're you're free and everybody thinks you're wonderful once you become enlightened. So so the the worldly dhammas remain as long as you're a sentient being in the world, in the physical world. But what's different, of course, is one's um, attitude uh, towards them. And one is not um, carried away by praise um, or hurt by blame. Not because one thinks one shouldn't be that way or one is completely impervious, but because one knows that Praise is just praise, and blame is just blame. Praise is like this, and blame is like this. And you, you know what it feels like, and you don't expect it to be any other way. And you know what, sometimes you get overly praised, sometimes you get praised a reasonable amount, sometimes you get praised less than, than you should be. Um, and sometimes the people who praise you uh, praise you with a pure 
motivation, sometimes with an impure motivation, just looking, yeah, this is, this is what it's like, it's like this. And you, and you take these things up as objects of study and interest, and you see that there is a relationship, the more that you crave praise, the more that you will fear blame, and the more painful the blame will become the stronger the sense of self, um, the more real and the more um, affected you are by praise and blame. The more you maintain mindfulness, and this uh, equanimity, stability of mind, happy, the happy mind, and the more you looking at experience to learn from it rather than to um, to amass and hold on to the pleasant experiences as much as possible and push away the unpleasant then these things start to, to fade out they, they just very become very insubstantial the, so, um, the so the mind which revolves around the sense of self is a, is a rigid, narrow, ignorant mind. I mean, it's, um, to see that clearly. I mean, I remember there's a, there's a really nice, uh, funny cartoon I read where there's a man and a woman sitting in this very romantic restaurant and the man saying to the woman, well, I've, I've been speaking about me for quite a long time now. Um, how would you like to speak about me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this everything has got to be pulled into this sense of of me. And there was uh, some years ago, this this man tried to assassinate um, an American politician. I don't think he was successful, but the police all jumped on him and you know, he shouted shouted out, now I'm a thousandth part of history. So, so this sense of wanting to stand out and to be someone, you know, this whole thing, you can be who you want to be. You know, and uh, this idea of that one, uh, one needs to be different from others, have some, some special idiosyncrasy um, that's um, makes, defines you as, as someone um, different from everyone else. And this is a, a very impoverished state of mind. And so, you know, you can be what you are already. This is more from the Buddhist um, slogan. And so, um, looking, interested, looking, learning, um, with the mind fortified, with mindfulness. So the Buddha said, uh, or say Ajahn Chah, our teacher, said that uh, to begin with, mindfulness is intermittent, like the drops of water from a tap. It's drop, 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 or, or perhaps drop, drop, <laughs> drop. But then um, if you apply yourself, um, and just keep at it uh, with great persistence and it's drop, drop, drop. And then you get, uh, finally, the stream of mindfulness. And the stream of mindfulness is what we call samadhi. Um, so it's not, samadhi is not something that you do, but samadhi is the result of sustaining mindfulness. Mindfulness um, can be compared to um, a muscle. If you're meditating and your mind wanders, you bring it back, it wanders and you bring it back, it wanders, you bring it back. Some people get very discouraged and say, just wasting the time, the mind just won't settle. But um, every time you bring the mind back, um, you are strengthening your mindfulness muscle. And if you um, are willing to um, observe your daily life and the effects of your meditation practice on your daily life, you'll, you'll begin to notice that um, in the midst of confusion, uh, when you get distracted, 
you, you recognize that and are able to draw your mind back to the present moment uh, much more quickly and easily than you could do before. And that's because um, the mindfulness muscle which you've developed in formal practice has come to your aid. So the, um, the Buddha in encouraged us to develop this muscle and to take that muscle as a, as a refuge. But the Buddha himself, um, referring to his own practice and the causes leading to his enlightenment, distinguished two main virtues. One was discontent with wholesome dhammas, and the second was unremitting effort. And um, many people know that Buddhism teaches contentment, but um, perhaps not so many people know the Buddha also taught the value of discontent. So the Buddha says, um, not to be content with the gains um, that one has, or the, the progress that one has made in, in practice, because um, unless one has reached the, um, the first level of enlightenment, the wholesome dhammas that one has developed uh, are still not fixed, and they can still decline. And, and this is one of the reasons why um, many of you uh, perhaps been disturbed by um, hearing about senior monks, monks who've been uh, in robes for 10 years, 20 years, and then disrobing. And if you have this idea of spiritual progress as like going up a ladder or climbing up a stairway to heaven, then you think, you know, how could he have been climbing up the stairway all these years and, and, then, um, and then leave and disrobe? And, and the way that that I would explain this is that um, if you have, a, say, a glass of water with a number of, of um, bugs in it and the, you want to purify that water, you have to boil the water at 100 degrees. Now, if you heat water up to about 95 degrees centigrade, you can feel that that water is really hot you could maintain that, that the heat for a long time. Um, and um, the difference between the temperature of the water and the boiling point uh, is very small. But if you should um, release the heat or allow the water to cool down, um, then you suddenly find that all the bugs are, you know, are still there. And, and so many meditators, and monks included, um, practice to a certain level where their minds become calm and they're able to maintain that sense of calm and certain <coughs> insights arise, but they don't take it to the level of boiling point. So all the, all the bugs are latent but still alive. And the moment that one becomes heedless or content with the, uh, the practices that one has done, then is creating the conditions to, um, to discover <coughs> that all the, all the bugs uh, are still there. And that can be a very depressing thing to find after one suddenly say, oh, uh, I've been wasting my time all these years. I haven't really realized anything at all. So the, the Buddha says you have to keep keep striving, keep putting up effort, unremitting effort um, until one reaches the goal. And um, that's, um, that's not to say that uh, one's overly goal-oriented, but that one finds that middle way where one has a clear sense of direction and aspiration and onward movement but at the same time, one is skillful enough to enjoy every step of the path and to 
be content uh, with the um, the practice, content with one's um, effort, but um, not to be content with the results and to be pushing on. So you have to find that kind of middle way where um, if you're looking too far ahead, um, then you lose it. If you get too caught up in the in the details, then you lose it. You seek to find that happy medium in which there is progress in both sila and samadhi, panya. So are there any, any indications um, of success? Uh, one is um, growing sense of chanda and enthusiasm for practice, but perhaps more fundamentally, the, um, the growth of compassion is the, probably the best indicator of development of true wisdom, because wisdom and compassion um, are, like we say, the two wings of the bird, of the eagle. And so if one is, um, if there is compassion without wisdom, then it's not going to be compassion in, in the true Buddhist sense of the word. And if true wisdom, if wisdom is truly arising in the mind, the understanding of the three characteristics, understanding of selflessness, then um, compassion arises more and more strongly. The extent to which one um, abandons this self-centered view of the universe, sees its um, insubstantiality, um, then the more one opens up to the suffering of all sentient beings, and the more one feels compelled to um, do what one can to reduce and allevi alleviate it. So the great, great teachers um, such as Ajahn Chah, you can see that they, they don't have anything that they need to do for themselves. They've done, they've done their own work. And they don't have any um, personal uh, neurotic needs. And so they have all their energy and all their time to devote um, to helping their um, fellow, fellow sentient beings. So the wisdom and understanding um, leads inevitably to compassion. So you, although in Theravada Buddhism don't kind of trumpet this in quite the same way as perhaps other traditions, it's just considered a natural um, evolution of the mind, that the wiser the mind becomes, the more compassionate it does. Um, so if one's uh, feeling one really kind of understanding the Dhamma, then this is a, a good test to see um, how, do you, how do you feel, how do you relate towards the people around you, in your family, at work, um, how do you uh, feel towards, how do you relate to people um, who don't treat you very well, who are not <coughs> immediately sympathetic. This is a good, good test. So we're practicing for liberation. Give, we give dana um, in order to liberate ourselves from attachment to possessions and to things and to liberate ourselves from possessiveness and stinginess, keep precepts, use recollection of precepts uh, as a way to liberate ourselves from harmful actions of body and speech. Uh, we develop mindfulness to liberate ourselves from the hindrances, and we use wisdom to liberate ourselves from the conceit, I am. So in every level of the path, right from initial level of offering food, offering dana, offering uh, help and sustenance to those around us, offering our knowledge and um, time to, to others. This is a spiritual practice leading to liberation. 
keeping precepts is a liberating practice, sustaining, developing mindfulness, liberating practice. And as we become more and more liberated from self, um, then the the heart blossoms with the Brahma Viharas. And this is the, the path of practice that the Buddha um, has given us. So these are a few words I'd like to share with you this evening. <coughs>